Good afternoon and welcome to the 14th Sankar Global Summit 2022. We have an excellent panel this afternoon, uh, led by Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, who has written a, a book called The Harambe Factor. Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, I'm going to pass it on to you for a few introductions and to lead this panel. Thank you so much for all of you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Urvashi. It's good to be back at Sankal. And I am deeply honored that in today's discussion, taking off from some of the issues which I mentioned in the Arambe factor, I have uh, my very eminent colleague, Ambassador Lakshmi Puri, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, and the founding Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. I don't think we could have found a better person or as an interlocutor of this. But I'm also very happy to have Antosing from the Managing Director of Intellicap to do this impeccable work on uh, renewable energy and other hybrid financing models, all of which come up. So without much ado, let me take this opportunity of talking about the Harambe factor. Harambe, the spirit of cooperation, and that is what marks India-Africa partners. The book goes over what we have done in about two decades. But essentially, today's session is devoted to some of the suggestions in the end of the book and how can we take them forward. Now, in the book, I argue that the time has come for more support to the private sector, more support to foreign direct investment and to venture capital. Now, this is not only what I said, this emanated from a series of surveys that we carried out among Indian companies and among African development partners as to what do they expect from India now. Secondly, among the sectors, while water, energy, and such the infrastructure is well known, essentially more and more expectation is leading to achievement of the SDGs. The pandemic put many things behind, but it also brought several things up. One of the things which fell behind was well, that just before the pandemic, Africa was breaking out of the aid consortium approach to a trade and investment led consortium. But by 2020, when the pandemic hit us, you know, the achievement of SDGs has started falling in Africa, which otherwise was doing well. So I think achieving SDGs on many of them which essentially is what Sankalp looks at, besides the cross-cutting issues of women, gender, and uh, circularity, there is much emphasis in Africa that this is where we need the support. And this support cannot come by creating debt stress for us. It has to come in a more imaginative ways. In the book, I have also spoken a lot about trilateral cooperation, which is India, another partner working in Africa to deliver better more. Many other countries believe that India's model of cooperation is better accepted in Africa than many others. And where values are concerned, we are far ahead. So therefore, there is this whole theme of trilateral cooperation. Now, if you put venture capital, you put SDGs, and you put trilateral cooperation and try and create a paradigm, you come up with impact investment. How do you invest more to create impact? How do you help the entrepreneurs? And more, how do you frame the issues? Because while we may want to do this, the issues of circularity and gender, the issues of financing, finding innovative financing means, finding out how we can have a package of, uh, you know, investment proposals which could be fulfilled, all this is not easy. So we are looking for a transition, but we are in a difficult post-pandemic recovery phase. With that introduction, I would now like to request Ambassador Lakshmi Puri to please give, her, give us your opinion and views given your vast experience in this space. Thank you, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh and my very Dear and distinguished colleague, uh, I'm very happy to participate in this Sankalp Global Summit 2022 and speak on the Harambi factor, SDGs, and women's empowerment 
in Indo-Africa relations. That's going to be my theme. Uh, I congratulate you, uh, Ambassador Singh, for your uh, commitment towards the cause of growing, enhancing, and diversifying Indo-Africa relations that shines through your excellent book, The Harambi Factor. I share your passion, born out of a long association with Africa myself, as uh, Joint Secretary Economic Division and Multilateral Economic Relations in Ministry of External Affairs from 1993 to 98, I oversaw the India-Africa initiatives of ITEC, the Indian Economic and Technical Cooperation Program. And I, I was also active in negotiating, implementing important plurilateral groupings, such as the G15 uh, and the Indian Ocean Rim Initiative, and at UNCTAD for seven years, I advanced India, Africa, South-South interregional cooperation in commodities, manufacturing, services, and technology. In fact, one of the last things we did was on oil and gas. At UN Women, I worked with the UN Regional Economic Commission for Africa and the African Union, and of course, bilaterally with countries, visiting Africa several times to advance the agenda of gender equality. Now, as a development practitioner, of course, quite apart from our association, you and I, I support greater collaboration between India and Africa as these two regions, we believe, will be the two engines of global economic growth and social transformation in the 21st century. Africa's GDP has tripled in the last 15 years. Population will double to 2.5 billion by 2050. And it will have a larger workforce than India and China by 2040. So both regions share a similar landscape, colonial history, economic and demographic opportunities, including the demographic dividend and challenges, of course. So achieving what I have, you know, long that's been my favorite phrase, achieving equilibrium on the con competitive complementarity continuum in India-Africa economic, trade, and investment relations will be immensely beneficial for both regions. Uh, your book, uh, Gujit, uh, contains a nuanced analysis of the economic and technical axes of the partnership consistent with the ethos and ideals of Harambi founded on mutual respect, cooperation and centrality of human resources in the development of a community of, and, and the nation. I would like to use that word Harambi to say that it would have been uh, perhaps evolved from etymologically from Hari and Ambe. And therein lies the foundation for gender equality and women's empowerment in Indian African relationship. It is apt that Ambassador Gurjeet identifies the interlinkages between economic progress and the achievement of the nine targets under SDG five on gender equality. And I want to just highlight this, it is SDG five, on, gen, on achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. And this was something I had the privilege of conceptualizing and getting included in Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. Now these interlinkages, in fact, at least 11 other SDGs, we have gender equality targets in eliminating poverty, enhancing economic well-being, improving access to health and education, food and agricultural sustainability, energy, climate action, housing, employment, political, social, and environmental empowerment. A majority of women in African countries and India are employed in the informal sector, cooperation policies must view, therefore, the unorganized sector in agriculture as, uh, and then as artisans, laborers, as caregivers, as grassroots and micro entrepreneurs. But all, also, as you rightly said, investment is the key and entrepreneurship is the key, but also to raise their stature to formal sector, higher value chain work and SME 
but also macro entrepreneurship. So it should not be just limited to micro. And that has been uh, an issue both in India and in Africa. So it is crucial for India, therefore, to develop an SDG-based women empowering, social impact making, you said impact making, cooperation agenda with African countries that will set it aside from the transactional, even exploitative cooperation agendas of other countries in keeping with the Harambi spirit. The Delhi Declaration of 2015, the India-Africa uh, Summit and PM Modi's 10 Principles for India-Africa Interaction recognize gender equality and women's empowerment as intricate, uh, inextricably linked to the SDGs. And the Delhi Declaration makes an explicit reference to greater cooperation on women's empowerment in line with Prime Minister Modi's own vision on women-led development. And also the AU declaration, again, we, we were very much collaborating as UN Women of 2015 as the year of women's empowerment and development. Now, very quickly turning to my suggestions for India, uh, they center around what I call a multi-layered paradigm of gender responsive economic cooperation at Pan-Africa, sub-regional, inter-regional and bilateral levels. On Pan-Africa level, we must seek synergies between the vision for a new India and its agenda for progress in the Amrit Kal that has begun now and will hope to accomplish the goals by 2047 when India is expected to become a developed country. And the African Agenda 2063, which is the blueprint for Africa to become a global powerhouse of the future and uh, with its 10-year uh, implementation plans. Now, we must make sure that all our cooperation with African Union and the ECA is gender mainstream. Our declarations of intent and principles of development and technical cooperation must be explicit in identifying this as a core tenet of programming and financing, including, as you said, private sector financing. India's participation in the African Development Bank, of which it has been a member uh, since 1983, is the fifth largest country investing in Africa with investments of 54 billion, 20% is significant in the regional cooperation context. And also the 600 million US dollar worth of credits that PM Modi announced uh, at the last um, India-Africa summit. Um, and a new India-Africa health fund. You refer to the pandemic, which is even more relevant now. So, and then India has invested financial and technical support in bankable projects aligned with the EU's transformation strategy in domains such as energy, construction, ICT, and railways in Africa, which could be gender mainstream in future. As you said, we have to also look ahead and see what we can do. At the level of interregional cooperation too, we have the Indian Ocean Rim Association, we have the uh, India, Brazil, South Africa cooperation, we have the BRICS. And I know you have written a lot because you've been in Japan uh, in trilateral cooperation, such as the North-South-South partnership of Japan, India, Africa growth corridor. I hope that is really picked up and taken forward. It is important that there are demonstrative programs that mainstream gender equality in whatever we do in these uh, areas with Africa as a partner. For stronger sub-regional cooperation, we should follow the same principles at the level of SADEC, ECOWAS, Maghreb Union, all these. Then for stronger bilateral cooperation, I have a few suggestions. Under ITEC, we should aim to have uh, gender parity in women beneficiaries as far as training is concerned in all key SDG AU priority areas mentioned. Now, partner governments must be per persuaded to nominate. I know it's a, a system whereby the partner governments nominate women candidates on a 50-50 basis. And at least we should mandate a minimum critical mass of 33% of women. I'm happy that ITEX programs have moved in this direction already. In the last five years, apparently, 
ITEC offered more than 25 specific training programs in key Indian institutions for women beneficiaries, both in traditional areas and in those areas where gender parity were always thought to be a big challenge, such as rural economy and development, water supply, sanitation, entrepreneurship, and women-led enterprises, technical and vocational education and training and labor standards and rights, financial inclusion and digital literacy, business management, and all these uh, areas. In terms of projects that are funded and executed under ITEC, there should be women's participation and leadership on both sides of the implementation divide. Uh, transversal projects should benefit and impact women's achievement of SDGs as well as, uh, as well. But there should be some dedicated, targeted lighthouse projects that uh, really benefit women's economic and social empowerment specifically and foster their productive capacity, employment, income, and importantly, entrepreneurship. And one example of such pilot project is uh, succeeding is the Barefoot College Initiative involving women in the production of clean energy solutions. I'm sure you know about this. And, um, uh, and uh, its replication across African countries, which already happened. And, uh, you know, as it happens, you and women, when I was there, we were participating and we were uh, cooperating with India and African countries to uh, roll this out on the ground. We are witnessing similar uh, demonstrative examples in uh, uh, other in financial inclusion, agriculture, food and nutrition, green technology, ed tech, health tech, ICT spaces as well. And uh, financial inclusion, in my view, should now become a focus area of cooperation with the enabling access provided by low cost digital technologies that provide last mile access. Now, these are and there are some exa interesting examples uh, where um, large scale training to women on financial inclusions in both regions. And I think ITEC should pick that up. Selfina in Tanzania, Indian School of Microfinance for Women in Ahmedabad, whereas projects by institutions such as Seva, Bharat, SIDBI, and HPPR. Uh, so this could be in integrated into India Africa bilateral cooperation through ITEC. Uh, one area where we did a lot of work in UN Women was the care economy. And there is now, I believe, uh, a kind of consortium that is being drawn up. Uh, is a, it's a particular area of mass quality employment and entrepreneurship generation where women are predominantly participating and they are impacted. Specific training programs towards formal labor practices for healthcare and wellness, child and elderly care should receive major government attention for cooperation. Uh, and of course, the government of India, Womania on GEM program. Uh, which has already resulted in public procurement uh, soaring from, uh, from women-led businesses should also become uh, a principal part of India, um, Africa uh, trade and, and uh, women entrepreneurs should be enabled to participate more actively in uh, India, Africa contracts. Uh, and in, uh, then of course the women's empowerment principles uh, which private sector has to accept. We should be incentivizing them for companies in, in, involved in India African trade and investment. Uh, also, I'm glad that the midterm review of um, the uh, India Africa Summit 3 highlighted women's empowerment as a focus area for India Africa uh, um, Summit 4. As and when the fourth summit is held, there should be a clear enunciation of the SDG 5 agenda in the summit objectives, a commitment for a Africa 50-50 and India 50-50 and our partnership 50-50. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Puri, for your very gracious and warm words, first towards my book. Secondly, yes, I recall very clearly how iconically you consolidated the ITEC program and gave it direction when you were JS uh, looking after it. And you know, that impetus that you gave made it the flagship of India's development partner. 
In my book, in the survey, the biggest brand recognized in Africa from India is the ITEC program. So I really, I think we owe you a lot uh, for having done that. The trilateral partnerships are actually now all veering towards impact investment. The Trilateral Cooperation Development Fund that the Ministry of External Affairs set up with the, uh, the UK and now with France actually are both looking at impact investment. So I think that is a useful takeoff on that. Uh, now I have uh, the great pleasure in inviting Mr. Santosh Singh, Managing Director of Intellica. Over to you, Santosh. You have read the book, so you have an advantage over me, having read it after I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, let me um, you know, uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here and uh, inviting you for the Sankalp and this is uh, you know, a forum where we celebrate many things. So very happy to be part of uh, uh, the welcoming team of Sankal to have you walk on the panel. And and uh, ma'am, uh, just hearing you, I think such a treasure trove of expertise on this panel that I am very much intimidated to say something, but I'll try my best to kind of uh, share my thoughts. Um, but before I go to that, I think uh, uh, especially to, uh, you know, Ambassador Sir, I did read the book. It was an intimidating book uh, to just look at that, but it was also very much rewarding to go through the whole, uh, you know, the well-researched uh, history of South-South cooperation. And uh, for those who have not read the book and they are interested into bilateral cooperation or they are working in the areas of international development cooperation, there are three key takeaways that I think they should look for uh, and, and they should read the book. One, this book is an immense treatise on learning from the India's Africa Development Partnership history. So uh, it was you know, a great pleasure to learn about the past history of these corporations. Uh, and, and for people who have been kind of working for merely 15, 20 years, unlike uh, you two who have been championing this for more than two, three decades, it was a very, very uh, you know, educative experience. Second takeaway was that how these partnerships uh, are different, how many of these partnerships that you describe are different from the traditional economic cooperation partnership. So that was a very uh, well-researched uh, kind of theme that emerged. And third, I think it was a guide to practitioners that how to use South-South cooperation to create a better shared future. So it is also a future-looking book. So I, I think for me, it was a brilliant, brilliant experience to go through the book and learn about that. So thank you again for writing that book. Now coming back to... Um, you know, the theme of uh, today's panel, uh, talking about the South-South cooperation. And uh, before I go into that, ma'am, uh, you know, we have been a big fan of the work you have done at uh, UN Women and all the work that you've been doing. And IntelliCap is a signatory to women empowerment principles. So uh, we do have uh, signed the thing. So we are, you know, very uh, uh, proud of taking those initiatives where we can contribute. Now, sir, for me, I think uh, I have been working in uh, Global South for now more than uh, you know, 18 years. I started my career in uh, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, and that was in early 2005, six. And since then, I have been kind of looking at Africa. And it is clearly emerging that if we have to achieve our SDG goals, then Global South has to overcome its development challenges. There is no other way. Uh, you know, SDG goals are dependent on global South solving the development problems. Uh, and not only for SDGs, if you're looking for the next phase of economic growth, the growth engine is the global South. World's top six fastest growing economies are in the global South, in Arab, basically they're in Africa. So how to kind of leverage these dual, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, dimensions. One, we are talking about overcoming all the challenges to achieve SDGs. At the same time, we are looking at this region to be the growth engine of the future. So South-South cooperation creates a, you know, a big value addition. here. Now, there was a one plug that you made that India's development uh, or India's interventions are very well accepted in global, uh, you know, in, in Africa or South-South cooperation. I think if I have to kind of think about what you said, you know, the traditional North-South cooperation or collaboration was more of, you know, a sympathy driven cooperation. They understood our pain, you know, and they wanted to contribute. The South-South cooperation is more of empathy. We feel each other's pain. We know that, you know, how we can, uh, you know, solve this. It's not about telling you how, you know, you should solve it, but it also know that going through the journey. So for me, 
South-South cooperation is more empathy driven rather than sympathy driven. So that's a big uh, takeaway for me. Now, ma'am, very well talked about some of the areas where South-South cooperation need to happen. But I want to touch upon, you know, three major areas, which is uh, almost critical for driving the entire South-South cooperation and, and where India has a huge advantage. Uh, access to energy, access to finance, and leveraging markets. As you mentioned, the development cooperation is moving towards market-oriented solutions, market-based solutions. And if we focus on access to energy, which is a critical factor of productivity, and in fact, it is a critical factor in achieving a good quality of life. So access to energy becomes critical. Access to finance, again, an enabler to many of these development goals and, and a tool to become resilient uh, in this changing time. So access to energy, access to finance, and leveraging market, these are three areas where India did not do incremental growth. We leapfrog to the next level. The kind of success we have achieved in access to energy or access to finance is exemplary considering the constraint that we had. You know, people talk about that, how our access to finance initiative is unparalleled. When people in US uh, wonder how we can do the money transfer in, in just two clicks and they don't have any way to do that. So India's repository of these experiments which paid off, it's invaluable for the global south in terms of how we can achieve those goals. Now, many of these uh, you know, developments that happen in India are a result of a very different kind of development uh, approach or development strategy. Obviously, the regulatory efforts the aid and subsidy, the role of government, all have a critical role to play. But there was some change that happened. And that change was that using all these tools to address the fundamental barriers in the market so that we change the economics of these sectors. Mm -hmm. We did not achieve the goal of solar primarily because uh, we subsidized solar. We achieved the solar success story because we changed the economics of the solar for good. And then we were not dependent on subsidy for uh, the scale. The efforts were such that we are changing the way these things are delivered, the changing the way these markets work. And that gave us a very unprecedented kind of pedestal to kind of talk about uh, the challenge in a different way. Now, two things that I'm very passionate about, and, and, and I keep on talking about, uh, you know, how this global South cooperation can happen. Climate action is the thing that everybody is talking about. And there, the global north has a role to play. They have committed $100 billion every year for the developing and the least developed countries. Now, these $100 billion could be used to just subsidize certain actions or it could be used catalytically to change the way uh, things can be scaled up. Now, India has a huge learning there. I will take some examples as you wanted me to talk about energy. India's solar story is result of policy reforms, institutional reforms, and reform the way finance is delivered to these sectors. And we did excellent work here that can be taken to many countries. International Solar Alliance is probably the first of its kind initiative originating from Global South led by our prime ministers and France uh, prime ministers' vision is a brilliant example that all the consolidated learnings are coming into a kind of nice package to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. The second major thing that happened, I think India is also home to many of these new uh, things that we're talking now, but they're no longer new, but impact investment, mm -hmm. social enterprises, right? Uh, you know, catalytic capital or, you know, financial innovations, these all kind of happened over 20 years in India. And since they happen in India, the good thing about these innovations is that they have a very similar kind of constraint that the global South has. So now switching that the learning that we have in India, how it can be applied to Africa, how the South South cooperation can change. I think, sir, as you are very much aware, 
if you want to achieve a scale, you need to leverage all kind of partnership. You need to leverage the private sector to come together. You leverage development financing institutions to come together. You leverage the civil society to come together. Now, while civil society and DFIs have a mandate to be there, they are supposed to drive the development agenda and, and, and build cooperation. Private sector does not operate that way. Private sector looks at the risk and reward ratios. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the risk and reward ratio for many of the countries in Africa mm. have not been very attractive. Now, a big focus needs to be put to change the risk reward ratios. So the private sector start moving in. We need to crowd in the private capital and private capital will not uh, come unless and until there is uh, a better risk reward ratio. Uh, you know, in the now, India's experience of leveraging these are you know, a good kind of learning ground for many countries, especially the way India leveraged many of these institutions where we created instrument which use capital to unlock capital in a big way. So leverage of four to five times. We, if we deploy $100 million, it unlocks 500 to $1 billion, that kind of instrument. So we are talking about uh, insurance, risk mitigation tools, blended finance facilities, these all have been perfected here. Uh, I'm not sure if somebody is doing a tracking of the number of credit lines that we have, dedicated credit lines yeah. that are catering to different sectors. Mm -hmm. These credit lines are a boon for many of the sectors. So huge amount of learning that is captured in the financial innovation that we can leverage. The second is, sir, uh, is the learning on the business models. So one is the financial part of that and then the business models. Ma'am talked about the Barefoot College, but you know there are many, many new generation enterprises that they have addressed the challenge of you know, risk reward ratio by having a better business model. Mm -hmm. They have innovated on the business model, the way the business is delivered. They have started incorporating a local youth, local women, local entrepreneurs in those business models that it becomes a win-win solution. And, and that's a very, very, you know, attractive uh, in those areas where we have a challenge of uh, delivery of those solutions. Also, a challenge of employment creation and the lack of capital and lack of training because these models uh, enable everything. Now, if you look at that, many of the social enterprises that India had uh, or, or is still kind of emerging every day uh, in the areas of agriculture, fintech, uh, health, etc they have kind of perfected this business model and they want to grow big. They want to cater to the global problem. These business models, these enterprises are now looking at partnership in Africa to take this offering to those countries. Now that's the second level. We have been talking about the big development partnership, a partnership where Airtel goes and sets up its shop. But now we are also talking about the small enterprises, save us you know, educating them about the insurance or somebody talking about the uh, local distribution model. So that's a second level of, you know, partnership we are talking about. Third, I think the big learning from India is about the regulatory or the institutional reforms. We are able to get the lowest priced and highest quality internet in probably the global south. And you cannot underestimate the value of this enabler that is resulting into many other services and offering to be there. And this happened because somebody had a vision to look at how these could be you know, made available to everyone. Many countries are still struggling with the cost of uh, high you know, uh, speed internet. India has solved the problem. We are on the verge of launching 5G. And mm -hmm. I assume that that would be as, uh, you know, uh, affordable as we have 4G solution. Now, with D3, I think we are very much capable of forging partnership. And when I say forging partnership, it's not about uh, you know uh, teaching. It's about forging partnership because the partnership would not only tell them what to do, will also make them you know understand and be partner in how to do it. I have read many papers where lots of best practices are written. This is what needs to be done. Everybody knows what needs to be done now. It's about how to do it. And if that needs to be done, then we need a most, uh, you know, a very deep level of partnership. Now, I would not be kind of uh, fair if I don't mention 
that in the south south cooperation partnership africa has a equal role to play in giving us some of the best practices they have their pay as go models are a phenomenal success which never uh, you know kind of originated in india it was uh, pay as go models were primarily uh, africa's uh, contribution some of the technological innovation they did are now you know trickling into indian uh, you know kind of companies so it's also a bilateral partnership in that sense it's not a unilateral that we are contributing last i think one of the key thing that i would like to focus on uh, when the future uh, you know discourse happen is about some of these regional level corporations the thing you talked about while you know we have a corporation at a country you know a bilateral level so one country to another but regional level corporations is very critical uh, and critical in the sense that africa while it has a huge uh, population but they are fragmented so how to kind of create initiative that gives the right kind of aggregation points mm-hmm. and unlock the new economics mm-hmm. if you look at that india's success also is coming from the uh, you know the aggregation of the demand and creating new economic value from that aggregation africa is still very fragmented fragmentation is that multiple level so if we get to that aggregation approach where aggregation of these demands aggregation of these solutions unlock the new economic value that would be a phenomenal success and and kind of drive the next stage of growth i'll stop here sir but uh, thank you very much for kind of most of the thing i said uh, mm-hmm. i was not able to frame them into right kind of frameworks I, i'm a practitioner so i i do work on these uh, fragment pieces but your book helped me to structure them in some kind of framework so thank you very much for that thank you santo i think you framed it rather well i mean you gave the exactly what we wanted the learnings from the book how to bring them into life now so that next 20 years or 30 years as the method of puri said the 2047 how are we going to bring them you have drawn so many you know inspirations from the indian way of doing things which is the spirit of harambe and how we will take it uh, over there so one of the thing that you mentioned was about the sympathy and the empathy, empathy yeah. so we had coined this that uh, in north south relations vyapar hota hai hmm. but when you have south south cooperation pyar se vyapar hota hai so that was the differentiation we had drawn that there was the, you know empathy very much very well said in that now you know you also brought this idea up about leveraging and uh, you said india has a very large amount of lines of credit but somehow i find that african countries are not borrowing any more there is a huge debt stress it's not only from us it's from everybody they just don't want to borrow and uh, you need to still bring down the challenges which you have mentioned you know how do you de risk certain things so one of the challenges was how do you reduce the cost of local capital available in africa for an indian company or how do you say one of your companies wants to do an impact investment in africa how do they get lower cost non equity participation now there are regional banks in africa lakshmi ji has mentioned the africa development bank but there are regional banks in africa for instance the ecowas bank for investment and development the trade and development bank idc in south africa now i think we need to work more with them because they are not only working with sovereign guarantee funds but they are working in the private sector indian sovereign guaranteed funds are actually given to them for lending in two step loans so far they have been used for smes perhaps time has come to convert them into sdg related impact investment by using the same funding route but directing it better one of the problems which i have discussed with the banks in africa is that there are opportunities let's say for solar energy but there is no um, you know a uh, track on which projects are saying there's a shelf lying there and you can use them there is no developed track of project no pipeline what they call so i have proposed in my book that part of our grant funding should go into rotational funds 
where you can support consulting companies to emerge with you know, a pipeline of projects which can then be taken up for blended finance or PPP or impact investment. And when the project actually runs, you can return that money to the fund. So a certain amount of uh, imagination has to go there. I'm already very happy that under trilaterals, impact investment is taking the priority. And several of India's partners in Europe are actually investing in Avishkar funds to go to Africa, which is in the parallel private sector space. So this is good news. It just needs a helping nudge from government to take it uh, forward. Uh, Ambassador Puri, if I just come back to you, you heard what uh, Santosh said. Hmm. Now, your conclusion was that everywhere we should make sure the gender parity comes. I have seen over some of several Sankalp summits in Africa and India is that there is a natural emergence of women entrepreneurs coming up with ideas. Yeah. To the point that I have stopped counting the so were they equal or were they the same. Mm-hmm. Now you tell me, is that approach wrong or do we need to consciously in the private sector keep pushing this agenda? No, absolutely. You see, there there is a spontaneous um, aggregation or increase in uh, women participating in the private sector, becoming entrepreneurs in different sectors. Uh, you know, there have been uh, traditionally, as you know, in Africa, 80% of agricultural work is done by women. So They have been workers, but they have not been remunerated. They have not been recognized. Similarly, hawkers, you know, and and, um, this this informal sector work, women have been predominant. So my point has been that you need to, and I think I really agree with what has been said, that we need to provide finance and this whole supply chain support to women entrepreneurs, to become entrepreneurs, not only micro entrepreneurs, but to become SMEs in the first instance and also macro entrepreneurs. So that is the push that is required. Otherwise you are absolutely right. There is a natural catchment area of women entrepreneurs, both in India and Africa, and also those that can benefit from, you know, trade uh, with each other, not only learnings, but actual trade with each other. Uh, So this is something that we can uh, certainly recommend very strongly that we have to have both the, the grants or, or credits or projects or programs that we uh, devise, we need to have those transversal programs also benefiting women, but then have dedicated programs as is the case now in ITEC. I'm very happy to note uh, that that target women uh, as beneficiaries, and as participants, and very importantly, as leaders, uh, because that is something, not only some, you know, that they are taking, and also teachers, you know, you're talking about learnings. There is so much that women entrepreneurship can teach. Uh, and in both in terms of, you know, you, you talked about the risk um, and, and uh, profit uh, ratio. Uh, well, that, that is something women, uh, entrepreneurs, it's amazing how how they manage that. Uh, I've seen in Africa, uh, in in West Africa, in in Southern Africa, I have really seen how wonderfully they manage that. And they have they are bolder. They have uh, they take more risks because they are seen as less credit worthy, even though they may be more credit worthy actually, um, and that has been proven. But they are they are out there, and I think we should be supporting them through whatever programs that we have, both market led or market driven, 
And I really like the point about leveraging the market. Uh, how do you get, uh, you know, how do you change the whole business model? Also that, that kind of support, uh, advising them, uh, and, and then bringing them into this inter-regional trade between India and Africa, that arc of, of um, interaction. Thank you. Uh, Pandosh, you mentioned, again, coming back to this point of leveraging, but you have in the past spoken a lot about blended finance. And since we don't have too many pipelines, how do you see the challenges to blended, because blended finance reduces the cost to the country, hmm. but it sometimes has risks attached to it. How do you see this developing? Sir, I think uh, blended finance, uh, while it is a new topic, sometimes it is used, uh, you know, uh, very differently than what it is. Uh, so there are two parts to blended finance. One part is that the different pools of capital coming together. Uh, when I say different pools of capital, there is a capital that is seeking commercial return. There is a capital which is seeking sub-commercial return coming from DFIs. And there is a capital which is not seeking even return. It's a grant capital. They just look at the achieving these outcomes. So the one part of blended finance that has been exploited well is lowering the cost of capital. Uh, and, and most of the blended finance facility focus this as an outcome that by designing a blended finance facility, I provide lower cost capital or more risk taking capital. The second use of this blended finance facility is also to enable you know, different kind of pipelines that are not being created automatically. And what I mean by that, then there are many uh, businesses which are struggling because their economics is not there. And I will tell you an example. Say, if I have to sell 20 solar lights in 20 villages, my distribution cost goes very high. Now, I have to invest into a distribution mechanism that basically gets the demand from 20 villages and then I supply. Now, the cost of this demand creation is mm. something is a market problem that I'm addressing. In ideal world, I should be able to kind of get the demand in one place and I supply that. It's a platform. Now, these kind of market barriers can be addressed by blended finance facility because they're not looking for the return. They are trying to address the market barriers. Now, one of the key roles that these blended finance institutions or facilities you know, have been playing is providing technical assistance. But what my learning is that the technical assistance have been more on the project development, where we say that, okay, you have everything right, I'll give you some money, you develop the project. It is primarily you know, done into the large infrastructure projects or power projects where uh, technical assistance facility is going into preparing the DPR and the DPR is funded by a blended finance facility. Now, the new blended finance instrument that we are talking about, they are not technically giving you money to only prepare DPR, but they work on creating the right kind of environment so that the economics becomes attractive. Mm. So have we changed the way demand is aggregated? Have we changed the way the capital is deployed? An example of that would be if a blended finance facility lowers the risk of uh, you know, uh, currency, lowers the currency risk. Now, 7 to 20% currency risk you know, covering currency risk is often around 7 to 20%. You know, it can go even higher for many countries. Now, if you reduce this, then the economics become attractive automatically. You don't need to give them the So that's the one way of looking at the blended from facility. How we can change the economics. Second, as Ma'am was talking about, there are many entrepreneurs who need a lot of support to develop right kind of business models. So we need to search the right kind of business model seed right kind of business models and support right kind of business model. And then the capital facility scales those business models. Unfortunately, we are talking more about scaling up those business models, but not focusing enough on searching, seeding, and supporting. Now, if you start doing searching, seeding, and supporting, you have a very healthy pipeline that is awaiting this capital facility to digest the capital and scale up. And that is one of the reasons you will see that in Africa, when we work, many people see that there is too much money chasing too many businesses. Or we don't have a capital problem, we have a pipeline problem. Because we always focused on this assumption that will create the capital pool 
and that will automatically you know create pipeline of this thing it doesn't happen automatically the number of incubator and accelerator running in india they have been doing the job for last 20 years now we are saying that these unicorns are coming and they are getting funding from some of the big private venture funds but earlier they were supported by very small capital some of the state uh, run incubators iits and iims they have been running these small shop which got big so flipkart did not come from you know uh, the soft banks intervention the search seed and support came from the local infrastructure the local intervention the academic kitchen all of this soft bank came to scale this up so understanding that the different kind of capital different kind of interventions are needed to different stages of this uh, growth of these things so for me blended finance should look at all the spectrum how we can support searching of these enterprises how we can support seeding of these enterprises how we can support you know the scale of these enterprises and that's where i think uh, as, as we have been discussing exim bank and others have been kind of not be able to deploy the capital that was there capital is there but they're not able to deploy because they are looking at a very different kind of business models and economics to deploy and that doesn't exist that's one and, and the, i think there's a one other challenge that we have seen sir is uh, the predatory practices that are infesting african uh, enterprises you will see that many of these uh, financial institutions are providing finance which is not sustainable in long run you are assuming the growth to be of certain type if there is a deviation from that growth then instead of the enterprise contributing to the value creation it erodes a lot of value to those uh, players and it it creates a very uh, indebtedness and other things that trap is a, a you know challenge that we are facing so for us blended pool of capital or blended facility need to differentiate in terms of what instrument they are providing one instrument is obviously lower cost of capital but then they can innovate into risk mitigation instruments such as insurance currency hedging facility facility for providing technical assistance that creates the uh, you know the demand aggregation etc so i would say that there is a need for differentiation between what blended facility could offer thank you so much i mean you have brought so many ideas to the fore which you know make sure that our existing paradigm of cooperation with africa can be actually given new faces and new roles now we are coming towards the end of this program i wanted to ask ambassador puri if he would have any concluding comments well um i think we were all agreed that um india africa trade investment and i would say there is an element of grant and you know that kind of cooperation that that trinity has tremendous value and potential given the complementarity in our economies and the common challenges that india and af development challenges and the sdg achieving challenges that we face you know we have just 8 years to go for agenda 2030 to be realized and uh, i think the recent uh, analysis has indicated that uh, both india and africa india to a lesser extent because we have achieved in some of the areas we have made good progress uh, and we would probably be uh reaching many of those achieving many of those sdgs by 2030 but africa there are many uh, uh challenges still ahead for them to achieve uh, sdgs by 2030 so i think we need to work together we need different ways uh you know to take you know what what wonderful both your book and what uh, uh we have heard just now um uh, from uh, our uh, other speaker uh, makes very clear that we have very good uh, good practices and success models i think it's very important to build on those but also we need to um as was suggested to use these success stories but also success stories in india to take them to africa and also draw upon the success stories there 
uh, and and also in in terms of uh, economic um, uh, complementarity, I think this whole issue of agricultural cooperation. You have highlighted many of these things: agri cooperation in agriculture, ICT um, areas of green growth. I think energy, uh, oil and gas. You know, this is one area where I had worked when I was in. We had done, in fact, an African oil and gas conference along with India here, with Fiki here in, in, in Delhi. So I think there are many, many areas of, of cooperation which make for, um, uh, you know, mutual um, benef benefit, but also going beyond mutual, for leapfrogging uh, our development. Great too. Thank you so much, Ambassador Deppner. Uh, now, uh, Santosh, your concluding comments, particularly tell me that all this vast work that you have done in Africa in recent time, where do you see the gender parity? Do you see it coming or do you see resistance? Sir, I think gender parity, uh, we are making some small steps in that direction, but it would be foolish to say that we have, you know, kind of achieved that or a uh, lot need to be done. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, not only from a uh, sustainable development goal perspective, but also from, you know, the larger context of compassion and humanity's growth. Uh, you know, you can't basically think of as a development outcome, but it has to be established. Now, when I look at some of these kind of challenges and when I talk to entrepreneurs, there is a new breed of entrepreneurs, a lot of women uh, who are uh, coming to the fore. But I think it's still very inadequate. Uh, if you look at the number of entrepreneurs who are getting uh, funding or number of uh, women who are participating, you can see the jump in the percentage. But if you look at the overall number, yeah, it's still it's kind true. of very low, yeah. right? So you can see that, okay, we jumped 200%, but you look at the larger picture, it's low. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, just to give you some developments are giving good signals. For example, many of the business models are now factoring in women's participation as a strategic advantage. They're mm. not doing it because yeah. it's, we have to include women. It's a strategic advantage to have women there. They mm. are more uh, a kind of, uh, they add more value compared to the uh, other. So in my view, I think some of the sectors that we are talking about, access to energy, climate action, healthcare, uh, access to health, uh, access to education, these are the sectors where traditionally both uh, as a provider and as a consumer of these services, women have been at a very, very, you know, marginal, uh, you know, uh, space. They, they don't have it. So uh, most of the women who struggle to get their energy access, uh, they don't have fuel wood, they don't have the lighting solution, they're women, right? So one way to look at that design business models, design interventions, where women is you know, inherent part of that discourse, not as a kind of gender layer that we talk about. Once we start achieving that, then we see that we will make significant jump. Uh, India's SSG movement is a good example to talk about. If you see the financial inclusion, they started lending to women primarily because it made more sense. They were more credit worthy than men. Exactly. And hence, immediately the uh, financial inclusion saw more women participating than men. So we need to kind of achieve these kind of uh, breakthroughs which uh, automatically creates uh, these kind of outcomes. Thank you very much. I'm uh, sure all of you will agree that we had a very invigorating session. And I'm very grateful to Sankal for giving me this opportunity. For an author, there can be nothing better to have an academic book discussed to the point that you can see what lessons we can draw and take it forward. I think that is what the book tries to do, jog initiatives and ideas. And uh, I'm most indebted to Ambassador Lakshmi Puri for your time and for your very clear comments and ideas that you had, which I have been uh, seeing, of course, over many years, but today our audience has had the benefit of them. And Santosh, I'm very grateful to you for your usual candor and clarity in bringing forth so many issues which make the Harambe factor a real thing. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lakshmi. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. And, and this was very uh, kind of.
wonderful to listen for me to, be to on this. Uh, i must say of course i've uh, heard uh, ambassador singh before and uh, i know about his uh, erudition and uh, uh, his scholarship and his diplomatic uh, skills but it was great to also listen to your experience and and your thoughts on uh, india africa uh, business and and cooperation i must say it was santosh is now closely working with the international solar alliance in ah, the search okay. for this blended facility oh yes i saw that they are the knowledge partners fabulous that's wonderful Thank, Thank you, you and I, I know, I see that you are working with women entrepreneurs. Yes, yes. <laughs> we we, we, we are very, very passionate, ma'am, about that. So that's the core cause that we are championing. So, uh, but for me, ma'am, it, it's it has been a very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, great experience to be uh, here and listening to both of you. I think uh, I'm just picking up the work that you guys have done for uh, uh, years. Uh, but I think uh, you and women. You are giving a, me form and shape and uh, feet and hands. <laughs> yes. yeah. that, you, that's Urvashi. the least we can do. <laughs> thank Urvashi, you. thank you very much. Thank so, you. Ambassador Puri, Urvashi will never let us do a session which doesn't uh, have gender balance. <laughs> so don't so have manners at all. Ah, no manners. No manner. <laughs> Isn't it? But, thank you. Thank you, thank, you. thank you so much and thank you to the team that's dialed in also. Thank you. Thank you.